This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and this is TWIV. Today's May 7th, 2020, and as everyone knows, we're in the middle of a pandemic caused by SARS-CoV-2. This pandemic could have been prevented. We knew after SARS-1, which ended in 2003, that bats in China harbor SARS-like coronaviruses, some of which have pandemic potential. And so what we needed to do then was to isolate some of those viruses and design antiviral drugs and maybe even vaccines that could inhibit a broad range of them, what we call pan coronavirus therapeutics. Of course, no one did that because there was no financial incentive. SARS-1 disappeared in 2003, and the companies that make drugs for us to keep us healthy, they didn't see a profit to be made, so no research was done. And therefore, in 2019, when SARS-CoV-2 emerged, there was nothing we could do to stop it. I think that can change if we make our drugs and vaccines in different ways, not by for-profit companies. And today's talk is an interview I did back in December of 2019 when I was in Singapore. It's a chat with the CEO of an organization called CEPI, Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovation. He's Richard Hatchett, and his vision is to raise money and develop vaccines for viruses that are pandemic threats, but which no company will touch. And together with me, speaking with Dr. Hatchett, was Lin Fa Wang of the National University of Singapore, Duke. And he, of course, studies SARS-like coronaviruses in bats. I think this is a new model for vaccine and drug development that should bring us to the next pandemic, because there will be one. No doubt about that. Listen to our chat and tell me what you think. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. We're recording today at the Nipah Virus International Conference in Singapore, which recognizes the discovery of this virus 20 years ago. My guest is the CEO of CEPI, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations, Richard Hatchett. Welcome to TWIV. Hi, Vincent. Nice to, nice to be here. Thanks. And also joining me from Duke National University of Singapore Medical School and a co-organizer of this conference, Lin Fa Wang. Welcome. Thank you, Vincent. Yeah, glad to be on TWIV again. Yeah, you were on <laughs> 200 and something. That's right. Yeah. Uh, which we called the real Batman. <laughs> he is the real Batman, I think. <laughs> that was and, down in Australia. That's right. Yeah. And that was in Geelong. Yeah. That we recorded that. So thanks for having me at this wonderful yeah. conference. I want to talk about CEPI today. I want our listeners, which are quite numerous, yeah. both scientists and non scientists, I want them to learn about CEPI. So let's start by finding out what it is. Great, sure. Uh, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations is a is a new organization. It was established in January of 2017. Um, it was inspired. The, the reason that it was set up uh, was a recognition that emerging epidemic viruses presented a, a threat and that the international community was not organized to develop vaccines against them. The, the problem with epidemic uh, diseases, obviously, is they're rare. Um, market forces don't really drive the development of vaccines because vaccine development takes a long time. It's risky. Um, CEPI was set up as a, a collaborative effort of a number of sovereign countries, uh, as, as well as philanthropic donors, including the Gates Foundation and Welcome, to, to collect funds to support vaccine development efforts against diseases like Ebola, including Nipah, Lhasa, uh, MERS and other other emerging viruses. So, was this your idea? No, it was it was really an idea that uh, a, a a group of global health leaders mm -hmm. came together. I, I did participate in some of the planning uh, efforts, but people like Jeremy Farrar, Bill Gates, uh, uh, other uh, Vincent Victor Dow from the National Academy of Medicines, 
um, and other global health leaders all collectively realized that we needed to do something to prevent okay. uh, a recurrence of something like the West African Ebola epidemic. So the Gates Foundation on its own wouldn't be appropriate to do this sort of work? I, th I think they saw the value of creating a, a dedicated product development partnership uh, that could focus exclusively on this work, yeah. Um, yeah. given the very particular challenges of developing these types of vaccines against these types of threats. Okay. Now, interestingly, on your website, you cite the Ebola virus vaccine as an example of how we had a vaccine for many years mm -hmm. and it took a year into the West African epidemic to deploy it, and you want to prevent that from happening again. I, I think what's, what's sort of ironic is that vaccine was developed for the Army to prevent bioterror attacks, right? Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. Bef before I came to CEPI, uh, I, I worked in the, in the U.S. Uh, biodefense programs, and there had been uh, long investment in the development of Ebola vaccines, but it was driven, as you're saying, by concerns about Ebola as a potential bioterrorism threat, not because of a recognition that a, vac a Ebola vaccine was needed for global health purposes. Yeah. I think that's unfortunate, isn't it? That we should really worry about people's health first. <laughs> well, it, 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 it's actually not surprising, and I think it's relevant to the uh, development of vaccines for NEPA. Ebola, for 40 years, had um, there, there had been outbreaks. They had all been compared, I don't want to say easy to contain, but they'd all been containable using traditional public health interventions. And and I think the the potential for community-based transmission of Ebola um, while recognized, it wasn't viewed as sufficient to require the development of a vaccine. And before 2013, I don't think anyone would have argued that an Ebola vaccine was absolutely necessary for global health purposes. Post-West Africa, I don't think anybody would argue that it's essential. And I think the, the concern with NEPA is that like Ebola, the, the range of the reservoir species is vast. There, there are at least two billion people living in areas where NEPA emergence might occur. And what you need is a combination of a transmissible virus and, and the right social milieu in which that virus has the potential to explode, which is what Ebola found in West Africa after being a known disease for 40 years. We've known about NEPA for 20 years. We've seen large outbreaks. What we haven't seen is a West Africa equivalent, and that's what we're hoping we can prevent. Yeah. We don't want to have that to have be the impetus for another vaccine of a different sort, right? Yeah. It seems to me from listening at this meeting, there's growing enthusiasm for the idea of making vaccines against rare but potentially devastating viruses and stockpiling them in case of an outbreak. Is that a reasonable reading of what's going on? I, 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 th I think so. One, one of the, one of the points that I've, I've made in a, in a number of venues is, is that emerging epidemic diseases represent a threat which in many ways is characteristic of the world we've created for ourselves. It's, it's, it's the downside of our interconnected world. Um, it, it reflects both ecological factors, climate change, you know, incursions into, into remote areas, obviously, but also the interconnected nature of the world and increasingly dense and, and well-connected populations. So I, I, I think it, it, we shouldn't think about epidemic diseases and we shouldn't put them into the balance exclusively with other global health problems like HIV, TB, or malaria, because then it becomes a zero-sum game. Sure. And we want to prevent that. I think, I think we need to look at epidemic diseases like we look at other transnational problems that require a collective response, like international terrorism, like climate change, um, or even, even like cybersecurity. They, they, it, it's just an emergent risk because of the world that we've created for ourselves. Is it difficult to raise money for CEPI? Uh, we've, we've done quite well for a startup. I mean, we, we have secured at this point around $850 million of, of either direct investment or what we call aligned investment. Um, and, and we are talking with a number of additional investors who are, who are considering adding, adding to the pool of funds that we've got. Mm -hmm. In a way, I, I view you as a modern day foundation for infantile paralysis, remember? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah. Started by the March of Dimes 
yeah. by FDR and Basil O'Connor to uh, sure. take care of polio. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Is that fair? <laughs> I, 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 I think so. I mean, I think the I think the polio story is a, a really interesting story in in that um, it was the emerging awareness of polio as a risk, particularly in the 1930s, because of Franklin Roosevelt, obviously, and, and his championing of of the March of Dimes, that that focused attention on the disease, which by the late 40s and early 50s, as you know, became almost a panic, in, certainly in America. And it stimulated the development of, of the vaccines. Um, first Salk, then the Sabin vaccine. And um, those vaccines, when they, the Salk vaccine, when, you know, the, the famous story is that when the, the trial was shown to be positive, the national trial was shown to be positive, church bells were pealing across <laughs> America. There was, yeah. there was such excitement. I think the, the development of the Ebola vaccine recently and 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 it's demonstrated success um both in west africa and and the results now emerging from the drc it's it's uh recent conditional marketing approval by the european medicines agency and and the very recent just last week uh announcement by gavi that they are going to open a funding window to create a global vaccine stockpile that's a tremendous advance for global health and in the fight against emerging epidemic diseases I'm curious of, about your background that brought you to this current position. Tell us about your training. Well, interestingly, I'm a, I'm a, a medical oncologist uh, by, by training, uh, although I did have uh, a long interest in infectious diseases, and I had done Ebola work in, in Central Africa back in the late 1990s. Um, how I ended up in public health preparedness um, is uh, almost by happenstance. I, I happened to get involved in, in the response to September 11th in New York City, um, happened to run what became the main medical triage area at Ground Zero, providing uh, medical support to search and rescue workers. And as a result of that, veered into public health preparedness. Um, before coming to CEPI, I worked for about 15 years in the U.S. government in the biodefense programs. Because of my background in medical oncology, I actually worked on radiation countermeasures, so so drugs and treatments to treat people who'd been exposed to uh, uh, high doses of radiation in a in a terrorist context, um, and then moved to an organization called BARDA, uh, the Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority that develops vaccines, therapeutics, diagnostics for terrorism threats and gained a lot of relevant experience for the challenges that CEPI faces. I've had a few BARDA people on my, my podcast. Mike Merchelinski. Sure. Um, Ed Niles, mm-hmm. another. And I've learned a lot about uh, what they do. And I can see how you would go from BARDA to CEPI, for sure. Well, well you know, the, the interesting thing when I, when I was asked to consider the, the role at CEPI, um, I mean, in, in many ways, the, the configuration of the problem is very similar. You're, you're trying to develop medical products for diseases that don't really occur very often, at least in natural settings. So you don't have opportunities for demonstrating efficacy. Um, you do have these, these uh, challenges. The market's not driving the innovation that you need, but but clearly there's a strategic interest in having the products. The, the, ch- the difference between BARDA and operating in CEPI and the challenge that I foresaw for CEPI was that at BARDA, you at least had the benefit of operating, at least in theory, under you know a single government where your regulatory partner, your, your uh, agency that was going to deliver the products, in this case CDC, and your upstream funding partners who were NIH and, and Department of Defense uh, research groups um, were all nominally working together for a single end. With CEPI, you're operating in a multilateral environment where all of the organizations that are contributing have their own priorities, their own agendas, and uh, it's all really truly a coalition of the willing, and, and there's, there's no command authority. That's right. So CEPI is a co-sponsor of this meeting, right? Yes. Yeah. And I know Linfo said you, you put it together in six months. Yeah, yeah. It's amazing. That's right. I think he's uh, done a great job, right? It, it, Thank it, you. It, it, <laughs> it, it, he's done a remarkable job. Thank you. Thank it, it, you. It's an outstanding turnout yeah. for the meeting. Yeah. Yeah, totally. I mean, you know, I met uh, Richard Ng 
March, and ah. <laughs> uh, so this is out of the very successful meeting they had uh, for Lassa fever in Africa. Okay. So they were thinking of uh, put up uh, for Nipper, and I was joking, you know, you cannot get a better place than Singapore because the person who discovered the Nipper virus, right. Dr. Chow, is in Singapore. Right. And I was at one stage rated the most published the handicap virus scientist. Say, well, say, we both are in Singapore now, and say, mm. if, if you're interested, we can do it. Mm -hmm. And Richard said, you know, if you do it, it has to be in 2019. <laughs> and that was like uh, end of March, you know. Then I said, oh my God, that's he just uh, made it. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that's. Uh, and then initially, I think uh, Richard was looking at uh, September, October, and I said that would be too stretching. Yeah. So we agreed on uh, December, early December. Okay. So you we're, had we're, a, we're professionally ambitious. Et cetera. <laughs> <laughs> You'd had a similar Lassa virus meeting, is that right? So, so I, we were invited. We we became one of the sponsors. We were one of the major sponsors for an event that was organized by Nigeria CDC. Uh, Dr. Uh, Chikwe, the the executive director at Nigeria CDC, has really led the way in Nigeria for elevating Lassa mm -hmm. as as one of their their priorities and. Um, he realized uh, in early, actually 2019, in addition to being the 20th anniversary of the identification of Nipah, is the 50th anniversary right. of the yeah, identification yeah. of Lhasa. Lhasa, yeah. That's amazing. In, what a coincidence. In, yeah. in, in Nigeria. And, yeah. he, and he used that anniversary as an opportunity mm -hmm. to, to um, hold this meeting. I think, I think they um, you know, expected to have a mm -hmm. couple of hundred participants as well, and they ended up having over 500. Yeah. A and yeah. it, it was... It was terrifically exciting to mm. see the energy and enthusiasm and momentum yeah. that that meeting created and to realize That's that we had a similar opportunity yeah. um, you know, here in Singapore to do the same thing for Nipah. Yeah. I'm always amazed that Lhasa, yeah. which causes far more disease in yeah. Africa than Ebola, yeah. still there's no vaccine. And uh, I have to tell you that there is a book about Lhasa discovery called Fever uh -huh. mm -hmm. by John Fuller. Yeah which I read in the early 70s, mm -hmm. and that's what inspired me to be a virologist. <laughs> so Lassa has a, a very important yeah. part in, in my career. Yeah. So what, what did you hope to accomplish by sponsoring, co-sponsoring uh, this Nipah virus meeting? Well, CEPI as an organization, I mean, we've, we've selected Nipah as, as, as one of five viruses in addition to Ebola that we're focusing on. So, so, so we've already invested in the development of four Nipah vaccines. And, and we have um, these candidates that are moving along that we're hoping to move into clinical trials in humans next year. Um, and of course, um, Nipah, we, we had the outbreak in Kerala last year that kind of raised the profile of, of Nipah again. I think we saw an opportunity, uh, which I'm, I'm glad Linfa embraced, um, to, to bring the community together um, to inject energy into the community and, and, and not exclusively to focus on CEPI's activities because there, are, there is also progress on, on a potential therapeutic, a monoclonal antibody, as you're probably aware. Um, and there's a need for point of care diagnostics. And, and, and there's a, there is, as, as we heard in one of the presentations yesterday, there is kind of a virtuous circle. If you, if you have therapeutics that you can offer or vaccines that you can administer, there's, there's more of a, of a uh, incentive to use diagnostics and, and to increase your surveillance and increase your understanding of the epidemiology of the diseases. And by bringing the community together, and, and our goal is, you know, through our partnerships and, and through the international partnerships to focus attention and, and, and basically say to the world community, let, let's go ahead and focus on NEPA for the next several years. Let's take it off the table. Let's, let's move these products forward. Let's improve our surveillance, improve our diagnostics. Um, Nipah is a dangerous disease, but there's no reason that we have to let a West Africa happen in order to, to address this threat. Mm -hmm. yeah. So tell us a little bit about the process. You said you're focusing on five viruses, including Nipah. Mm -hmm. If you're starting in the beginning, what would you do? Would you call for proposals? So the, 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 the way we put together our, our portfolio is, is through a series of calls for proposals. I mean, CEPI was a brand new organization starting from zero, and we wanted to get started fast. And so when CEPI was established in January of 2017, and this was even before I had joined, I, I, I became CEO in April of that year, um, 
they issued a call for proposals. They had initially focused on just three diseases, on NEPA, on Lhasa, and on MERS. And we put out a call um, globally for proposals to develop mm -hmm. vaccines. Obviously, there were vaccines in very early stages of development in most cases. There were a couple of MERS vaccines that had reached phase one clinical trials, but no Lhasa vaccines mm -hmm. um, and no NEPA vaccines had ever been brought to mm -hmm. clinical trials, but a number of candidate vaccines had been developed, you know, either in academic institutions, government institutions, or, or elsewhere. And we had um, a number of partners who were developing promising vaccine platforms mm -hmm. who were willing to work on these viruses because it allowed them to advance their underlying technology. Mm -hmm. And so we, we put the call for proposals out in, in um, January of 2017, it took us 14 months mm -hmm. to establish our first partnerships. Mm -hmm. And, um, but since then, since, since March of last year, we've, we've put together now a portfolio. I think we have 26 vaccines mm -hmm. that we're supporting the development of. Um, the five diseases, in addition to the three that I just mentioned, also include chikungunya and Rift Valley fever. Mm -hmm. All of the diseases that we're focusing on have been identified by WHO through their R&D blueprint as, as either priority or in the case of chikungunya, a urgent um, disease that uh, don't have effective countermeasures. And what, what we're seeing is that the, and, and, and I think I, I saw this with Lhasa um, a little bit earlier, yeah. um, but I think we have the same opportunity in NEPA is the, the funds that we're injecting into the system to support the vaccine development and to support some of the enabling science that goes along with that. I mean, we're supporting epidemiology studies, we're supporting the development of standards and assays against um, the pathogens that we're uh, targeting. Um, actually, uh, sort of exerts a magnetic draw and it pulls other researchers in yeah. and, it, and it creates momentum mm -hmm. ac across the whole array of countermeasures. And what we're really trying to do um, as, as CEPI and the C in CEPI, the coalition um, aspect is really important. We're, we're not only trying to be a product development partnership that is investing in particular products, we're actually trying to change and create an ecosystem that is conducive to the development and ultimately the sustainability of these products. And that includes working with partners like Gavi and UNICEF and WHO to establish stockpiles and create um, you know, uh, criteria for deploying those stockpiles using the products, um, but also creating understanding and awareness of the pathogens and, and a demand um, for products to address them. So at what stage do you support this work? Do you start, if someone had a, a platform idea, would you support that? Mm -hmm. Would you do preclinical all the way through to Phase one, two, and three. So, so right, right now, in, in the the funding that we have secured is for the first five years of CEPI's existence, mm -hmm. and so we're about almost halfway mm -hmm. through that cycle. Maybe maybe slightly more than halfway through that cycle. In in the first five years, our our targets are to take these vaccine candidates, almost all of which, mm -hmm. with the exception of, of a couple of the MERS vaccines we're supporting, are in preclinical development, mm -hmm. and. Within five years of initiating our funding, the goal is to carry them through phase two in uh, clinical trials and to establish what we have called investigational stockpiles. So these are stockpiles of the candidate vaccines that are meant for deployment into clinical trials in the event of outbreaks. Mm -hmm. um, I think in, in CEPI's next five years, we hope to go beyond that. I mean, ultimately, we want these products to be able to be used under some kind of regulatory mechanism, whether it's licensure mm -hmm. uh, or, or some other mechanism. Um, but the goal is to have vaccines that can be used during outbreaks. And particularly, and I think this is really important, and, it, and, it, and it's part of CEPI's core mission, it's, it's not just to develop vaccines, but to ensure access to those vaccines for the populations right. that need them right. yeah. uh, as global public goods. Yeah, I have, a, I have your brochure here, mm -hmm. which can be found online as well. Yeah. Uh, you have committed four hundred fifty-six million for nineteen vaccine candidates and three rapid response mm -hmm. technologies. There's a list of them here. Uh, which, which do you think are 
going to be the soonest in clinical trial? So we have, we have uh, two LASA vaccine candidates have already entered clinical trials, okay. phase ones. I mean, but these are the yeah. first LASA vaccines ever to make it into yeah. human clinical trials. Um, as I said, a number of the, of the MERS vaccine candidates that we're supporting had reached phase one even before our funding, but we, we um, one of a, a MERS um, candidate that we're supporting um, that's, that's uh, being developed by uh, Oxford um, is actually now starting a clinical trial that CEPI is funding. I think there, there are some very promising NEPA candidates. One of the most promising, um, I think, in terms of being a low-hanging mm-hmm. fruit, uh, yeah. so to speak, which, yeah. uh, <laughs> Fruit Batman. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Um, yeah. But, um, uh, you know, is, is, is actually based on the licensed Hindra yeah. equine vaccine in Australia. Um, the problem with the Hindra vaccine in Australia uh, is that it is combined with a, an adjuvant that's only used in veterinary vaccines. And so it has to be reformulated. But, yeah. the, but the preclinical evidence for that vaccine uh, against NEPA yeah. actually looks really, really positive. Yeah. And um, so that's a, that's a, that seems like a fast track candidate. Yeah, I'm biased NEPA. because I was intimately involved with right. Chris Brodo and others. And uh, you want to talk about yeah. yeah, it's incredible because that soluble G vaccine against a hand virus, you know, initially because uh, for a major vaccine therapy in Australia in those days, you know, politically would not be, you know, a, a, a favor if we use NIPA as a model, you know, so we use Hendra. But scientifically, and surprisingly, that we found out is that NIPA G antigen protects the, or the Hendra G protects NIPA as good or better. So scientifically, we still don't understand, but practically, it's working like crazy. Okay, so this is the soluble G yeah. vaccine. We always say we're very proud of at least it's the first licensed vaccine for a BSL for pathogen, although it's for horse use, but it's still licensed, goes through all the, and so this is with the help of CEPI now. I agree, I think it will be a low hanging fruit, you know, because uh, the same antigen has been demonstrated to be very, very efficacious in protection in monkey models against the hand and the nipper. So it's really the formulation and then phase one, two trials. So you think a Hendra yeah. G will be licensed as a NIPA vaccine. Yeah, I Amazing. think that, you know, that's <laughs> because all the preclinics say that it's uh, mm-hmm. very effective and we have done so much studies in all yeah. the models and now you have the licensed vaccine have been utilized more than, you know, 600 uh, uh, doses. Now, that being said, I mean, yeah. I, th- I think we are looking at that candidate as, yeah. as, 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 as being one that, as I said, looks yeah. like a low-hanging fruit. Yeah. But CEPI's approach to vaccine yeah. development is, is to develop a stable of candidates uh-huh. um, because you never yeah. know why a vaccine candidate sure. might fail. Yeah. And it might fail for reasons that it doesn't work. It might yeah. fail for safety reasons. There might be business reasons. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we've got a number of other promising candidates mm-hmm. as, as well. And, and one, one is, mm-hmm. is based on the VSV platform that mm-hmm. is the basis of the, of the Merck. Yeah. Vaccine, and you know we've we've got uh, yeah. a, a chimpadno-based uh, vaccine, and we've also got a, a, a vaccine on a measles vector, mm-hmm. and and they all look yeah. promising. Yeah, that's great. The technology is there, as you said yesterday. And the other thing right. is that uh, you know, uh, uh, good or bad, you know, you have a very fatal disease, but the G antigen is so effective. Yeah. You know, you can use it as a recombinant subunit, or you can develop. De- uh, Deliver with VSV, measles, you know, adeno. Uh, yeah, at least in animal models, they were all fantastic as a vaccine candidate. Yeah. So I guess that's one of your goals for this meeting to yeah. showcase all this work so everyone can see what's going on, get ideas, yeah. Yeah. fertilize, and so forth. Well, I, you know, the, the exciting thing about this conference, yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm sure that yeah. I'm not alone in learning yeah. a tremendous sure. amount at this conference. I mean, it, it, it's, it's so exciting to yeah. see sure. the, 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 the wide array of presentations. We're going to have a vaccine. Uh, session this afternoon and, and the vaccine developers that we're supporting as well as a, a couple of other mm-hmm. vaccine developers will be presenting right. their work and it, and it will be presented in the context of all this other you know state-of-the-art knowledge mm-hmm. about this particular right. pathogen. Mm-hmm. So uh, how is the response of governments to this? I, I know the people who get your money are 
happy, but what about governments who have been unable to do anything in these areas? Are they, do you get good feedback? It's, it's, well, it, 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 it's, a, it's a really important part of our model. I mean, I mean, we are, as again, going back to the coalition aspect, um, we think it's important to have the private sector. We think it's important to have, you know, these sovereign funding partners. But we also think it's critically important that the countries at risk for the diseases that we're focused on be involved, not only as, you know, waiting for the potential to be potential recipients of the products that we develop, but actually engage them in the development process. So, so we've included persons from countries at risk in our uh, internal review committees. Uh, on our scientific advisory committee and our portfolio review that we just had in November. Um, the exciting thing about this conference, and I'm, I'm mm -hmm. so, so pleased yeah. with, with the way uh, yeah. Blenfa and, and, uh -huh. and his co-chair have organized it, is we, we've got around 230 participants, I think, yeah, yeah. and over 100 from countries at risk. Mm -hmm. And, right. and you know, it, it's, yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's really exciting to in, include them at this stage of the That's development right. process uh, and, and to get them engaged. And, it, and it's also important because they need to be evaluating the vaccines, deciding if the vaccines that we're actually developing are, are products that they can use, and then being prepared to use them if and when the time ever comes. I think that's great. How many yeah. countries are represented here? 23 countries and it was 245 it's great. participants. Yeah. All right, I have one more question. As you know, part of the WHO roadmap there are a bunch of viruses and there's disease X. Mm -hmm. Yes. So if we have next week yeah. disease X, would you respond in some way? So absolutely we would. And, and the one aspect of our program that, that you mentioned briefly that I hadn't really talked a lot about is our, our focus on developing rapid response mm -hmm. platforms. Nipah was disease X 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. Ebola was disease X 40 mm -hmm. years ago. HIV was disease mm -hmm. X. Um, every new emerging virus is disease X. What, mm -hmm. we, what we don't have right now our, our capabilities to rapidly de develop definitive countermeasures against new diseases. And so we, we have a whole separate arm of our funding that is focused on developing um, vaccine technologies that offer benefits in terms of speed uh, in multiple dimensions, speed in terms of time to generating a candidate vaccine, speed in terms of time to scaling up production, and, and speed in terms of time to providing clinical benefit. Um, unfortunately, the, you know, commercial markets for vaccines don't really put a premium on mm -hmm. speed of development. Yeah. They just put a premium on, on safety and mm -hmm. efficacy. So, so I think we, we need to make these strategic investments to drive technologies mm -hmm. that might offer these benefits. I, I think if mm -hmm. we can develop the technologies, um, and, and, and particularly if we can develop technologies that can be easily scaled, mm -hmm. we, we potentially can offer broader social dividends mm -hmm. in terms of, of democratizing access to vaccines and potentially yeah. making vaccines available for other applications like oncology. Um, I guess your comment of, well, you know, the vaccine manufacturers mostly focus on the safety and the efficacy is because uh, they're most dealing with not emerging and uh, uh, emergency diseases. So I hope that, you know, the CEPI's platform, and so this afternoon in the vaccine uh, talk, there will be one really they kind of kit Put them as a KPI to say if disease X comes from the gene sequence to a vaccine candidate is 16 weeks. Okay. So this will be presented this afternoon. So I'm looking forward to that. So what I try to say is that mm -hmm. maybe we need a slight difference on mindset for developing vaccines against emerging and emergency diseases. You know, so speed right. is right. the essence. Yeah. Could I, could I make yeah. one, one pitch to your audience? Yeah. Of, course. Yeah. Um, of course. We do have an open call for proposals. Yeah. Right now, in inviting. Um, candidates who have who have vaccine technologies or vaccine-like mm -hmm. technologies, and that's an important, um, I, th I think, qualification. Um, if 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 they have a technology that can provide an immunoprophylactic benefit rapidly, mm -hmm. and the technology, particularly if the technology looks like it could be produced at a at a price that that lower and middle income countries in particular uh, may be able to afford. We're very interested mm -hmm. in talking to you. And, and on the CEPI website, uh, that call for proposals is available. I'd invite mm -hmm. any of your listeners uh, mm -hmm. um, you know, working in scientific disciplines to take a look at it. Well, I think it's mm -hmm. a brilliant idea. It's been something we need. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I think it's great to see it working. 
So congratulations in Linfa. Yeah. Congratulations Thank on you. a great meeting. Really Thank appreciate you. it. So my guest today, CEO Richard Hatchett of CEPI. Thanks so much for joining me. Where can listeners go if they want to help out? Yeah. Uh, take a look at our website. It's, it's www.cepi.net. Mm-hmm. Um, we have a newsletter. Uh, we're, we're eager to connect with partners from around the world that are interested in helping address this very serious challenge for our times. Great. And Lin Fa Wang, thank you for joining me. Thank you, Vincent. And I'm glad finally you made it to Singapore. I made it to Singapore, <laughs> and uh, the science is great. I haven't been out of the hotel yet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe tomorrow. <laughs> tomorrow you should do that. <laughs> I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. We'll see you next time. So that's my chat with Richard Hatchett of CEPI. Go to their website and find out what they do, and maybe you can help them out. I think it's a great model for developing vaccines so that we'll be ready for the next pandemic. Another nonprofit, Ready, has emerged to develop antivirals so that we'll be ready for the next pandemic. This is how our drugs, our life-saving drugs, need to be developed going forward. You can find TWIV at microbe.tv. Questions and comments, twiv at microbe.tv. If you like what we do, consider supporting us. Microbe.tv slash contribute. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.blog. I want to thank ASV and ASM for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins for the music. This episode of TWIV was recorded, edited, and posted by me, Vincent Racaniello. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>